So that's what got me interested. And at the time, didn't have, um, didn't have social media essentially, so I didn't really know what other things I could do within construction. The one obvious thing that I could think of was going into architecture school, so that's where I went. I went to an architecture school in a small town in India called Manipal. And I just wanted to go through, so my degree was a bachelor's in architecture. And I just want to go through a few of the subjects um, that I had just to get you guys, just to get you guys interested and more aware of what, I'm sure a lot of, people, a lot of you do know this already, but anyway. Um, so a few of the subjects that actually I was interested in, and well then history of art. Structural design, which is kind of, um, it's, it's very math heavy. And I know all of you guys are here because you're interested in STEM. It's actually very funny because growing up, I was a weak math student, I was a weak physics, and I was a weak sciences student. I was good in art and sketching. So for me, to get into something like architecture, I thought, Initially, I thought it's all going to be, you know, creative design and just building things. But coming in, I did figure out, okay, there were, there were a few extensive um, or heavy science slash math courses. One of them was structural design, which I was horrible at. But I still managed to graduate, so that's fine. Architectural graphics. Now, this is something that I was very, very interested in. This is um, essentially graphical representation of any kind. So anything from sketching to creating uh, plans for buildings, plans, elevation sections, renderings, all of that comes under that. Acoustical design was another subject that is fascinating. It's acoustical design is like the study of sound. So how, you, how, how do you make sure outside sound doesn't enter the building if that's the intention? And how do you make sure this, your buildings are more soundproof? Building services, so that's all the nasty stuff in buildings, the plumbing, the sanitary sewers, the, the, the air conditioning, or lack thereof. Environmental design, kind of, it's, it's um, it's how does your building function in the environment it is in, which essentially means that if a building in Antarctica is going to be very, very differently designed than a building in, you know, a tropical country. Virtual design and construction, which is a big thing now, is um, basically having your building completely designed on in software virtually, in, in 3D, and then using that as a tool to build it on site. So it's something that now it's, it's very, very useful and it is, um, it's a big field now. Uh, woodwork is, um, I was actually very, very interested in woodwork because turns out my ancestors were all woodworkers. I did not know this when I got in, but apparently we were. Um, Woodwork really helped me do things with my own hands, and in architecture school, we built a lot of um, scale models. And having that background did help me in school, and it also helped me outside. Interior design, we all know, I think there's, there's a, the a Kenyatta offers interior design. Project management is um, essentially managing construction, managing, managing construction from the start to the finish, to close out an occupancy. And that's actually something I'm doing on campus right now. So out of all of these different avenues that I could go into, I eventually ended up going into project management. And we'll get to how I went there in a few slides. Ge geology, yeah. Okay, so uh, I was wondering, so like your day-to-day -day, like, life at like, your job, I guess, um, is it in the office most of the time, or do you need to go like out 
It's a balance of both. I am in the office and then 50% office, 50% site. Okay. And what do, you, what do you do all your own site? What do I do? I don't actually build anything on site, if that's what you're asking. But in order for me to do my office job, I need to know exactly what's going on in site. So, so you do like measurements? No, I don't do measurements. Oh, okay. I, I'll get to it. I'll okay. I have a bunch of slides regarding that, so hold your question. Building materials is, as it says, the materials that are used to make a building, whether it's concrete or steel or even chairs that are in the fabric of the chairs, the um, wall panels, the ceiling panels, lighting fixtures, all of that comes out of building materials. Landscape design is, again, fairly obvious. It's the design of the site, essentially. And it's, it has aesthetic purpose, but it also has practical purpose in terms of, um, you know, collecting rain, for example, if you have um, bioswales around or things like that. Or um, it also, like, landscape design also helps keep the temperature of your site and your, your building more balanced. And that, again, goes back to climate studies, which is how do you make sure your building interacts with the, with the atmosphere and climate outside, and how much of it do you want included and how much of it you don't want. Working drawings kind of ties back to architectural graphics, which is specific, uh, specific drawings that you create to build your building. Urban planning, I think it's called city planning here or town planning. It's, it's, a, it's, it's the same thing you do with, pro, with buildings, but on a larger scale for, for, for a whole city or a town. And housing and economics kind of ties back to urban planning and how do you design housing and how do you um, go about locating housing uh, near highways, near, near wetlands, near um, commercial areas, industrial areas, all that. This is just to give you an idea of if anybody is interested in going into architecture, what your initial few semesters are going to look like. It may have, this, this, is, this is like 2002, 2003, so it may have changed by now. But when you get into architecture school, there's a lot of, it, it starts off with art and then goes into science. So there's a lot of sketching, there's a lot of painting, drawing. These are all, I think all of these are um, either pencil sketches of mine or um, pen sketches, I'm not sure. And then there are some very bad paintings that I promise I'm much better at now. This, um, I just wanted to give you like a sample, like an example of how, um, how you, as, as a student, the kind of projects you, you you'd be asked to do, or the kind of design work you'd be asked to do. This looks like a maybe a second year project to me, second or third year project of mine. Um, and it essentially includes a site plan that I get, that I design. Uh, I'm, yeah, a um, site plan with all the buildings. We're given a site and then we're given a brief of you know what, on this site we need, we need you to design a, in this case, a forest research training institute. So once I'm given that brief, either in, in, in groups or individually, I go and I do my literature studies and I go and do my research to find out what exactly is a forest training, forest research training institute and what needs to be in it. Do we need classrooms? Do we need lecture spaces? Do we need offices, do we need recreational area, is it, is it, does it include on-campus housing, does it not? All of those questions get asked and answered in the course of the project. And the reason all of this is important is because if you do progress and move on to become an architect or stay within the construction industry, a lot of this, a lot of what you do in school is going to help you because that's exactly how we end up doing things on the field. So 
yeah, so that's what we go through, and then you eventually, this, this looks like, th this, this is my final layout design, my elevations, it's a graded site with a water body sections, and then these are, I th you start off, like I started off with a preliminary foam model, and then you progress to a more detailed model, with pink trees, apparently. Uh, and again, this is some of my work in, um, in, 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 in school, in architecture school. This, almost all of these, I think, yeah, almost all of these are, are um, uh, they're created using software, so they're not hand-drawn or anything. Um, how many of you people know about drafting in, or, or have seen a T-scale or a T-square? Oh, there you go. We have two at least. So yeah, I started off using those, but I, I doubt students and use that now in school. Uh, what is it? Yeah, this is... So I just wanted to go through... If, if any of you guys do decide, and I hope you do, because architecture is wonderful, um, one of the major things you'd end, you'd end up doing is your thesis. Your, in, in my case, it was my fifth year was my thesis year, but um, it, it might be different elsewhere. And the reason I bring this, put, put these bunch of slides in here is things that you you possibly wouldn't do in your professional life. You can do semi-professionally in architecture school. And for a thesis about like a year and a half, I wanted it to be personally as interesting and as exciting for me as possible. So I decided to, and you can essentially choose any topic under the sun, any, the only thing you need to make sure is your your um, final product is 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 something related to architecture. That's that's the only constraint. Um, you have research theses and then you have practical ones. I chose to do a practical thesis, which is to go out in the field, choose a site, um, and build something on the site. Not physically build it, but design for it. So, because it was a year and a half and I didn't want to bore myself with office buildings and campuses and things like that, I chose to design a water park. And it was the funnest year of my life because I essentially got to go do my research in water parks and theme parks all day, every day, for free. So there's nothing better. And again, I'm not going to go into detail of my design. If somebody is interested in theme parks and water parks in general, you can come to me later on and I can explain it to you. But um, this was a live site that they were building a water park on in the, uh, water park in, in the future. So I just took that and I made my own. And so, and, and this, uh, the reason I'm putting these up is to show you the progression of what you do in your earlier years in architecture school and what you do in your later years. So the earlier years, as, we, as I showed you, were more sketching, a lot more informal, more artistic rather than technical. As you go through it, you get to do a lot more technical design work. And doing this helped me even help me figure out or rather not figure out, but help me realize that there are so many fields within construction and within architecture that you can choose. Because I met with slide designers, I met with um, wave pool designers, I met with a guy who has a PhD in water, just water. I met with engineers who put in the plumbing systems for these big wave pools. Um, I met with uh, biologists and um, experts in um, 
oceans in uh, specific kinds of jellyfish and the, it, it was it was lost and this is what I eventually came up with and I at the time I was very proud of it I think I still am I don't know if anybody will have the money to build it because that was not my concern at the point at the time but just again just to give you an idea of the kind of work you'd be expected to do or or what you'd learn to do in school that's a let's i think like a bunch of slides going into a balancing tank and a little pool there and i think that's a jellyfish display that that's that needs to be kept at a very particular temperature otherwise the jellyfish will die i don't remember what the temperature is now um, that is actually the entrance bridge to my site and for a little while I was actually very interested in pursuing uh, bridge design but I realized I'm really not very good at mathematics so I dropped that idea but I'm still I still love designing bridges in my free time I just don't execute them so that was my kind of journey within architecture school now I know a lot of you would eventually get into the workforce, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how easy, difficult, frustrating, and good it can be. So I, my first job right out of architecture school wasn't very difficult for me to get. It was just the way the industry was at the time, and jobs were fairly, easy to, to be had. So I moved to New Delhi, which is the capital of India. And I'm of Indian origin, by the way, if in case anybody doesn't know. Um, so I moved to New Delhi, and I worked for, I started work for one of the biggest construction companies in India with about like an 8.5 billion US dollar annual turnover. I worked on a, I started work on a very high profile project. Um, we were designing and constructing um, Terminal 3 of Delhi International Airport with a construction budget of 700 million. So it's a big, big project. And the contract that um, my company had was an engineering procurement and construction contract, which is in these lands it's called a design. It's, yeah, it, it's called a design build contract, which essentially means that you one firm engineers the building or designs the building, procures the materials for the building, and constructs it. So it's all under one umbrella. Um, Again, I'm not going to go much into detail of the design itself, but um, this was the terminal, and then I think there were two existing runways, and then we, we designed and constructed two new runways. And I'm just going to let move through these images fairly quickly, but there is a purpose for them, and I'll tell you that in a little bit. So that was a that was a departure level uh, sketch, typical planter detail. Again, some sketches um, for pavilions, I think retail pavilions. Some more sketches, and I think some shop front section showing the different lighting sources. I think and lighting design. This is what I mentioned before uh, in one of my previous slides. This is what a working drawing looks like. So if I give this to a contractor, he's not going to be able to build anything because it doesn't have dimensions, it doesn't have any details about what material this is, what's the you know, join, de join, join re detail over here, what happens here. So, but if I give this to the contractor, he knows exactly what he needs to build and he knows exactly what material goes in and, and all the details. So this is what a detailed, detailed drawing looks like. And this is 
or working drawing or construction drawing. So these are again examples of what those drawings are. Now, you saw the difference like, between these drawings and these drawings. These look closer to what I did in architecture school. But fortunately or unfortunately, why when you're right out of college, nobody lets you do this. You end up doing this stuff. And for, for like a 21, 22 year old right out of college, sitting in a de on a desk with a laptop, churning out 50 of these drawings a day, is not fun. It, you, I, maybe for some of you it is, but it wasn't for me. So what did I do? I quit. <laughs> and this is going to happen to a lot of you, no matter what field you go into, whatever, whatever you study and how much you enjoy it in school. The moment you get out and start your first job in that field, you are going to be disappointed. Nine times out of ten. I've had friends who've had the exact same experience. Some have stuck on for various reasons. In my case, I was fortunate enough to have my parents not encourage me to do this, but not discourage me. And if, if I wasn't feeling it, I could go back home. So at the time, and again, this is all, remember, this is all like pre-recession, pre-financial meltdown. So I didn't actually worry about, oh, what do I do if I don't have a job? So that's what exactly I did. I quit because I was frustrated. I couldn't understand, I, I wasted five years doing all these wonderful things in school and then I couldn't implement any of it in college, uh, sorry, in, um, in, in, in professional, in my work life. I was disappointed, disillusioned, and that just made me quit and this kept happening. I, I lost it in my first job, I'd like to say three months maybe, two and a half, three months and then I just Friday came and I gave my letter and then I moved out. So that's my next move. And because I was fortunate enough to have a cushion, yeah. So like for your first job, you, you work for this uh, EJ construction company. Mm -hmm. But as an architect, uh, I mean, um, architects want to work in a Do you have like a team of architects? For yes, we do. But so. You, but still, you are working. 50 of those per day. Well, yeah, and there are other people just like me doing the same thing, so I wasn't alone, and everything else about the job was wonderful, so it, had, it didn't have anything to do with my, my boss was wonderful, my colleagues were wonderful, the place was nice, the pay was good, so you will be frustrated with what you end up doing because it's not going to be the same as what you did in college, whatever field you're in. And Again, if you're, in, in, this is kind of the theme of my presentation, if you may, of trying to figure out through hit and trial, through just going through the experience, what's right for you and what's not. And I know there are people who are gonna be very fortunate to know what they want from day one. And if you're one of them, brilliant, and you, you, you wouldn't go through this. But a lot of us, myself included, I got into, I, I was interested in things, but I didn't know how interested I was. Or I was, um, I knew things I, I thought I liked, but maybe I didn't as much. And that's something that you just have to work through. But there's also, what you need to remember is, eventually what you end up doing, you have to like it. Because there's no way you, you'll be able to sustain that day in and day out of going to work and coming back and going again if you don't like it 80% of the time. Oh yeah, there, so during my, um, I, I should have put in a slide of two of that, but I did um, intern at a bunch of places 
during architecture school, and that did help me a lot. But like, I did um, one of the I, I did like a four no a six month internship in um, an architecture firm, which I I worked in departments all, all the different departments of the architecture firm. So that's interiors, landscape, structural detailing, design, pre-design, pre-construction, detailed design renderings and uh, graphics, all of those departments I worked in. And it did help me a lot to know what I didn't want, so I knew I didn't want to go into interiors. I, know, I knew I didn't want to go into landscape. But the stuff that I was still interested in, those, it did help, is what I'm saying, like it did, but it kind of painted a slightly rosier picture of the world than it actually is. Because when you're paid, and this was, in my case, it was an unpaid internship, so. I didn't, there was only so much they'd give me to do, in a way, but um, it did help to answer your question, but not entirely. But, but it's, it's a good thing, as if you can use any of your um, uh, vacation time or time between semesters to do internships, nothing better than that, because that's, you're kind of wetting your feet getting into the market, but without the, the, the fear, and without the consequences of it. So, so, yeah, because I quit, I moved back to my hometown in Kuwait. And I essentially was in free fall. I didn't, for, for, for a good year or so, less than a year, but yeah, a good year, I didn't know what to do. I didn't waste my time, but I did not, I, I, I volunteered, I did some part-time work, but it had nothing to do with my degree. So I still was feeling this frustration of spending five years slogging, working really hard, enjoying it, but then not seeing the results immediately. So that's the other thing, you never, very rarely will see immediate results of you know, your education. But I can say now that I'm happy I did it. And I did some freelance work, this is essentially work for friends and not getting paid for it, so. What I did do was I did the exact thing what I was talking to you about, was try and understand the things that I am interested in and then figure out a way to navigate those and to, to either go ahead and do something in those fields and ignore the ones, or not ignore, but essentially make sure the things that I'm not interested in. And that's where I got the, when I was doing this process of self-study, I realized that I'm not yet ready to get into the job market because I don't have the qualifications to do the things that I want to be doing in a company or professionally. So, that made me move here to a little small town called Stanford where I did my master's in a civil and environmental engineering and my major was construction engineering and management. So of all the things that I studied in architecture school, I was 80% or 90% sure that this is what I wanted to be in because for me, this seemed like the perfect balance of design, construction, and being physically on site and seeing the things that either I or somebody else has, has designed being built. So again, just to, just to briefly go through the subjects that I took or the courses that I took, there's so many, many, many more, but this is just to give you like an idea of what a construction engineering and management, a project management degree is all about. So we did a bit of scheduling work, oh, I'm sorry. We did, did a bit of scheduling work, estimating work, building information modeling, which is what I did in architecture school too, so that I just worked uh, on a course there. Construction accounting, organization design for projects, renewable energy sources, politics, and infrastructure investment 
that does have a lot to do with um, housing and urban planning, energy and environment, labor relations, real estate development, certifying green buildings, design, management of construction operations, creating sustainable environment. Now, what I really, really, really enjoyed at Stanford, or what Stanford offered me was, my architecture degree was very, as, as is the nature of the degree, was very theoretical, but this kind of gave me the practical work exposure that I, I, I really needed in order to get into the job market again. And while at Stanford, I got interested in um, sustainability and energy design and, um, ha ha and, and ways, in, ways to make buildings more um, energy efficient. So that actually led me into doing a certification program um, called LEED. Some of you may be aware of it, but this is, this is something that uh, once you do get into the workforce and, uh, or, or higher studies, doing professional certifications is always an added bonus to um, your skill set and making making sure you're, um, you're, you're, you're better equipped to enter the job market. So again, if anybody's interested in um, LEED, which is essentially uh, a green building certification program, so building one and building 23 that we're building over here, both are gonna be LEED Building 23 is going to be LEED Gold certified, and I think building one is going to be LEED Platinum certified. So that is that just means that the building has the, the construction of the building has been um, has has been environmentally yeah more um, it, it, it's more sustainable building uh, um, both in construction and in operation. And then, what happens? Recession. That's this, I graduated Stanford um, 2009, which was when the, the subprime mortgage crisis, whatever that was, um, basically made me unemployable, as, did, as it did for a lot of other people. And I was an Indian student on visa. So I didn't really have an option to, my option was to either get a job or leave the country. And in this particular case, my parents were not very supportive. They're like, no, you need to stay there and make your living. We're not gonna support you anymore. So I, so all the fun stuff of me not struggling to get my first job, and then quitting it without a second thought came back to me over here because no matter what I tried, I couldn't get a job. I must have applied to maybe a thousand companies, or even more. Just any company that's remotely related to my field, I sent an application to. I did everything from networking to calling on alumni to everything. And it did, and there were a lot of people like me in the same boat, just because that was the time. But I did eventually end up getting a job that made me move cross country to Washington DC. And my second job was in a consulting firm called Design and Construction Strategies. And we did facility portfolio management, capital asset planning, enterprise building information management. None of this makes sense to you guys and none of this makes sense to me even now. But it was a job, so I did it. And I, I think the first year, because I didn't know anything about it, this was something that was in the big realm of design and construction, but it wasn't actual design and construction. Um, so 
But again, like I said, a job's a job. I love the place. I love Washington, D.C. This was during the Obama era, so it was a wonderful place to be. And New City, everything was wonderful. I loved it. After about a year, a year and a half, I, the, the sameness of the job started to set in. And also the realization that I'm glad I have a job, but this is not what I want to do for the rest of my life because this is not what I signed up for. So this time I made the slightly more sensible decision to get a job and then quit the one I have. <laughs> that, yeah. I've done a lot of stupid things in life. <laughs> but, um, the other, it, it, that was one of the reasons. The second reason I wanted, I, I eventually had to leave this company was um, because it was a DC based firm, they had a lot of um, uh, government contracts, a lot of security contracts, and as an immigrant, I could only have a certain level of security clearance, essentially. So there's only so much I could do within the company before I had to leave or I had to quit. So. What I did was I, and the other thing was, uh, and maybe a lot of um, students who were who left home right out of high school would feel this. I was missing home. I was missing family. So I made the move back to Kuwait. So that's kind of my life story, is just shuffling from one city to another. Back in Kuwait, because I was, I was doing my job interviews for jobs in Kuwait from DC, I, 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 I never did a face-to-face -face interview for my job. It was just, on, I think, on Skype or a few phone calls and emails. So my third job in Kuwait, I landed, I started, and then I realized my mistake. It wasn't the job that I had interviewed for, and this is also something that I'm glad in hindsight it happened to me, but it's something that you all need to be aware of, is when you do interview for jobs that are not local, most likely you'll be doing it through either Skype or phone calls or um, emails, and you may not actually go and see the location, visit the office, know anything more about it. Of course, now you can still Google and do all of that, but there's still only so much you can find. And I didn't do that. I didn't do my due diligence. I did not ask the right, right questions. So when I landed there and I went into my first day, it was a disaster. It was, it was, it was just horrible. I don't even want to relive it. <laughs> But um, because I'd gone through the whole journey of n struggling to get a job, I knew I could not quit this. And because I was living back at home, my parents wouldn't allow me to quit. So what did I end up doing? I, I think day two, I started looking for a job. Day two. And that... And, it, 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 if a job's bad enough, it will motivate you to get into a better job. So that's what that's exactly what I did. I did not become complacent because sometimes when, it, and this is something that personally happens to me a lot, is you start doing something and even though it's not exactly what you want, you fall into the rut. If everything else is going okay in your life, you become complacent. So I did not, I forced myself to not become complacent with the job. And the last thing which recession helped me was I did not quit before I had an alternative. Now, you could have any alternative. In my case, my fourth job was not my ideal job. And this, and by the way, right from graduation to about this time, it's been, I don't know, like six years have passed. So nothing's happened, you know, blink of an eye. So I start my fourth job, it's not ideal, but it's definitely better, I mean, anything was better than the previous one, honestly. So that's, 
it may not be perfect, but then it does help you, it does help to get out of a terrible situation. And while I was at my fourth job, I wasn't, I, I was still motivated enough to leave it, but I wasn't in a hurry to leave it. So I took my time to find exactly the kind of job I needed. And it took me about, I would say, like six, seven months, but I did. I did find my fifth job, and it was perfect. Everything, it had architecture, it had, um, I, I was uh, the lead architect at a construction site. So I was doing my, I was using my architecture degree, I was using my, um, it did have, it, it was a lead building that was being built, so I did, I get, did get to use my lead credentials and my certification and my environmental studies. It was on site, which is what I love doing. It had construction management, and it was because it's Kuwait and Kuwait's bread and butter is the oil sector that has the most money. So it was a rel it was quite a high paying job. So everything was good. But can anybody guess what I ended up doing? I did end up quitting it. <laughs> but for no, no, no reason related to the job this time. And I ended up moving back to this wonderful place, back to the Bay Area at my current job. So as Rance introduced me, this is what my current job is. I'm uh, working with a company, uh, Swinerton Management and Consulting, as an assistant project manager. And we are the construction managers for the San Mateo County Community College District. And we're currently managing their CIB3, which is Capital Improvement Program number three. And that has four capital improvement projects at Kenyatta and Skyline. And I'm part of a team that's managing Building 23 and Building 1. And I thought it'd be just fun to go through a few of the... Oh, yeah, before that, I've been... Because I've been, talking, because I've been talking a lot about projects now, I just wanted to go through quickly what, in, in construction terms, what defines a project and what a project is. So, and I'll take Building 23, the new science building, as an example. So, every project has to have a project initiation, obviously. Uh, that that could include anything from, hey, you know what, we are old science buildings and tatters, so we need a new one. Or it could be, um, we have extra money, why don't we use it to augment our existing program and add something. Once you get through that, you have to start with collecting user requirements, which is, okay, we do have a science. We have the budget for a science and technology building. Now, what do we need in it? Do we need chemistry? Do we need biology? Do we have existing facilities? If we do need biology, what do we need in it? All of those details get worked through from user requirements. And that'll include maybe talking to professors, talking to students, talking to uh, the community in this case. And once we have those requirements, um, the designer starts um, space programming, which essentially is allocating or figuring out how much space a program would need. So, for example, biology would need labs as well as classrooms, but computer science would probably only need classrooms with, you know, data facility or something like that. And um, maybe mathematics wouldn't need labs at all. So that's what comes under space programming. From space programming, you develop your criteria documents, which is something, it's, it's criteria documents in the next one, which is the design concept. And bridging documents is when you get, um, when you actually physically start laying out, because everything before the, the first three items, there's no physical layout created. From the criteria documents and design concept, you start creating a physical layout depending on what your site is. In this case, based off of the space programming requirements, we chose the site that the Building 23 now is being built at. 
So you get this whole bridging documents and then you now want to go to a, a contractor or an architect or a contractor architect team to request for proposals so that you can get the best value. You, in, in this case, it was a best value contract, so you award it to, on the basis of certain requirements and criteria. You award the contract, and then you start with the schematic design, detailed design, and construction documents. And you go through procurement. A lot of these processes do go on, or they, they overlap, or go on simultaneously. Um, you go through procurement of materials, you mobilize your team on site, you do the construction, finish construction, close out, then you have your end users move in, and then your operations and maintenance period starts. So that's something that over here Kenyatta facilities would be doing. So again, I'll quickly go through these because We're okay. So, the B1 building, the budget's 115 million. Sorry, 115. I'm correct. Yeah, 115 million. <laughs> you can tell I'm very bad at math. <laughs> Project scope was to demolish the existing gymnasium and construct a new 85,000 square feet building. And this is just details of the building. I'm going to let you lead, read through it. essentially has gymnasium facilities, locker rooms, um, two pools, um, parking lot six, I think we're doing some work there, um, fitness center, lots of fun stuff. And this is just the renderings. If, if I had stuck around in an architecture firm, this is what I'd be doing, or part of what I'd be doing but I chose to move towards the construction side. So that's actually an activated roof, and then this is like a jogging, running track, and I think there's like open air yoga. So that's the pool. One's a competition length pool, and one's a instructional pool. So there you see. Oh, that's a good one. How many of you remember the um, entabulation? Or, or the column? That's what, so we demoed that early this year, which I know a bunch of you weren't happy about. You probably won't be happy about what I'm about to show you next. But this is what we're going to replace it with. And you can start with the jokes. I know I did. <laughs> That, yeah, that's how it's going to look like. <laughs> but that's not me, that's just what the designer chose to do. Again, these are just plans. In case anybody is interested in these things, contact me later on and I can um, explain more. This is the building being demoed early this year. Just photographs. Um, this is once the building was demoed, the site was regraded, and the wall started to be built. Again, this is the wall concrete being poured, and the wall being built, and that's the wall. Oh, this is the, I thought it'd be fun to show you. I wasn't the one who did it. I was just videotaping. Close your entablature. 
Can anybody tell me what the material, what, what, what do you think the entablature was made of? <laughs> Very close, yeah. It's construction grade styrofoam, but styrofoam nevertheless. So it wasn't too precious. Don't worry, you'll get your much, much better, stabler structure that wouldn't take 10 seconds to be demoed. <laughs> Oh, and that's I I love demolition. I think so that's the last of the building being done. Yes, there is. You could be a demolition contractor, and that's what you get to do all day. So, just the same thing that we did for B1, just a brief about um, the new science and technology building. It's a $70.2 million project. The scope is, again, there was a little bit of demo involved here, but it wasn't as exciting as that one, because we just demoed um, a little bit of a hip of dirt between 22 and 18, and the spoils were moved to lot 10 to create the overflow parking that you guys use now. Uh, we had to build a retaining wall to hold back the lot one parking because that's at a much higher elevation than um, this building. And it's a 50,000 square feet math and physical science building and just a bunch of programs that are um, going to be included in it. So that's actually pretty close to how the building is going to look like, which is a good thing. And as of now, you would see like, the GFRC panels. These things are going up. The curtain wall will start probably in the next two weeks. And the steel structure is already done. That's how your building is going to look like at night. That's interiors. And that's just um, floor plans. This isn't entirely detailed. Oh, okay. Well, at least, I mean, I'm going to picture that and say, hey, look, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I know the third floor is all biology. And then you have a very pretty roof deck. If, you, if any of you do uh, come for this site tour, that's a wonderful place to stand and look at the campus. So that was um, steel being placed, and um, the reason we have a flag over here is because this was uh, at our steel topic out ceremony, which is um, when the building reaches its maximum height. So that's again some more steel, steel being placed. Um, this is rebar for grade beams. That's great being being bored. That's these are concrete trucks with an extendable arm pouring the uh, metal decks. Slab on metal deck, I'm sorry. Um, this is the retaining wall being shot treated, um, which is essentially the same concrete that's being poured, but instead of being poured, it's sprayed on. This is the second floor uh, metal deck. This is the GFRC panels being put up. That this is going on right now. And oh, the other exciting thing that I really like about my job right now is 
even though I'm a lot of my job, somebody asked me, is sitting in the office and answering emails. I do get to go and be on site, A, and B, visit um, manufacturing plants. So this is actually um, a GFRC panel, which is this panel being built in the factory. And it's part of the QA, QC process where you need to go and make sure the product that the district is paying for or the client is paying for is being built the way or manufactured the way it's supposed to be manufactured. Um, this is again the panel in a factory, uh, at the factory. That's how the panel actually looks like from the inside. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Oh, my fifth job? Yeah, like after your boyfriend. Oh. <laughs> oh, my boyfriend was living here. <laughs> so I, it was there was no reason for her. But I made sure I had a job lined up before I moved. That I will never do ever in my life again. <laughs> I'll always make sure I have something lined up and then move. So yeah, that, that, the job was still perfect. <laughs> Uh, not as far as I know, not, a, not, not with the CIP3 program. The CIP3 program is essentially these two buildings and there's a bunch of like little tiny modernizations and retrofits and then um, hopefully CIP4 or something. But yeah, just these two for now. <laughs> yeah. Years of school was five plus one and a half, two. So that's like five years of architecture school and then um, one and a half years of my master's uh, degree. And then in between, I had, a, I had a year gap between the two. And then since then, I've been uh, shuttling around, trying to find what I'm good at. <laughs> so, all right. Um, there's a, I went to, a, 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 it's called Manipal University, it's a fairly good university in India, but I don't think it's that well known over here, but um, yeah, I did, I, I went there. There's a lot of, um, I applied to a bunch of schools, not too many. Um, but my whole application process was essentially because I was an international student, I had to give, um, I, don't, I had to get the GRE um, and then um, write a bunch of letters and, and essays and things like that. Um, that. That process wasn't too bad because I wasn't working, I wasn't doing anything, so I had enough time to do my research and make up a story and put it across in the best way possible. But um, yeah, I had to do that. That, that is painful. <laughs> it is. <laughs> no, no, yeah. Uh, you said that there was a, a career pathway for demolitions. Yeah. I was in the uh, military for four years and I worked with demolitions. So I was close to demolitions specific. And um, that, that kind of interested me. Oh, that is so much fun. Yeah, I know. That is actually so, because we are in an occupied campus, you couldn't use explosives to demo this building, but when you're not, you can, that, that's what most demolition contractors do use, controlled explosions. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I know a lot of people who love doing that. So you have to be a contractor to work with Yes. And what do you need to be a contractor? What do you need to be a contractor? So, you need to do an engineering degree. <laughs> Actually, you could be a contractor without that too. So you need five years experience, um, that certain field or construction, and then you take, there's actually a uh, contractor's license, you take courses on that, and you take the exam, and that's what you get five years of 
Part of my part of my plan. I want to become an engineer and become a contractor. Yeah. So I, I one of my jobs, my um, second or third job was with a contracting company. That's the one that was really, really bad. <laughs> Oh, it was, it was, part of it was my fault in the sense that they didn't, um, I didn't ask, you know, what the job site location is or specifically what's, what the facilities are over there. The people, again, the, even with the bad job, the people were nice. It was just, I wasn't fit for the job that they wanted me to do. And um, there were a bunch of other little things. It, it was way too far from where I lived, and um, the timings didn't match up. It, it, it was a night job that um, I felt unsafe in, and you know, things like that. So.